uh, starting the recording. A uh, welcome to Monday, uh, May eight. Uh, so if you guys can mute yourself there, I'll mute you. Um, Monday, May eighth. So let's go with the agenda for the team meeting. So I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, sharing, sharing the screen. And go ahead. So I'm, I'm recording the. Ah. Uh, little crash. Apologies. Sorry, crash. Um, I'm going to put in the meeting link. I was all excited and I, I crashed on you. So I'm putting uh, the link. I'm um, sorry. Okay, I was all excited, but we crashed here. You guys, please mute yourself. Here's the link for the working document today. It's the agenda for today and here we go so agenda may 8 first of all welcome to the new team members we've got ahmed and io uh, ahmed's from iraq io is from nigeria so we're really going international here with more representation across the continents here uh, so what we do typically is we follow this agenda it's about an hour total time but we we'd like to stick to it there's a place where um, item number 10, you see the, the questions page. Um, I'm not sharing yet. Let me share. Sharing. Okay. Uh, item number 10 here is the questions page. So any questions that arise during the meeting, uh, that's where we leave them because I'm going to just be blowing through stuff here. Um, so feel free to write down questions that we can actually spend formal time so you don't have anything left left out that you forget or that you uh, don't get answered so this document is editable so you can edit that uh, the page 10 all these documents are editable cloud editable so we can collaborate okay first is uh, first five minutes at 11.05 is uh, the recruiting progress. So uh, here are the numbers. We're, um, you know, you can see a definite rise. This week we can see we have we have kind of a slump. What, what happened last week was we had the big, you know, big preparation for the workshop, the workshop where we built the 12 printers. But now it's, it's kind of a, a little slump what I see here, or people haven't filled out their logs, so please do so if you haven't. But uh, I've got some numbers for you here. So, so far, the team is 13 people officially accepted out of 43 interviewed so currently we have a 30 percent acceptance rate so you guys uh, you know not everyone makes it through the free CAD test a lot of people drop out before that uh, uh, feedback from a few people was that all oh, free CAD just doesn't cut it uh, those people don't have the patience to do it but but I think free CAD is really good for what we want to do and of course it has bugs but that's where we are so congratulations to all of you who are on the team because you're 30 percent right now uh, and as i mentioned welcome to ahmed and io uh, as far as the timesheet make sure you fill out your timesheet i know there's a bunch of people that haven't filled out their timesheet so please go ahead so let's look at page number two um moving right along here if i can switch to page two there we go um sorry Going back to page two. Come on, internet. Here we go. Look at these graph graph so far. So we've actually started February first with Emmanuel, our first guy, but we are at the ninety degree ninety day point. We've already gone through ninety days, basically a quarter of development cycle. And these are the total developer hours that we, we have. So 
this is developer reputation essentially, but Emmanuel has already reached a 120 uh, hour contribution mark. So he's already done about 12 weeks of work if you counted 10 hours per week. Uh, so congratulations Emmanuel. So what we do is, is on people's badges, the badge that you receive, we add a star for every every quarter development cycle that a person completes. And actually it's not really necessarily the 90 days. If it's less, um, less time, if people put more than 10 hours per week, they can do it in less than 90 days. Or if they take more time, it'll be more than 90 days. But the way we want to have it, and this is a big, you know, big discussion. Uh, Jose and I were talking about this quite a bit about, you know, what the, what the developer reputation is for how people join a project and how they continue to to much more significant contribution well to join the project entry level point right now we're, we're being very clear it's join as an OSE developer that way you can have a concerted role in the project moving along the critical path along the timeline budget and um, project goals for the year most important document there being the critical path for the year which is an um, OSE crash course but once a person has experience in how the things work uh, you get the star you're an OSC developer and this applies to things like chapter formation because you know there's a couple of chapters out there that are pretty much not coordinated with OSC work but the idea is that we focus all energy so we get viable enterprise activity going that provides the positive um, monetary or financial feedback loop or just energy feedback that allows the project to scale because that's something we failed to do over the decade you know 2004 was first when uh, I coined the term open source ecology but for that time we've been doing a lot of development we're constantly pushing the limit on everything but at some point you have to scale and make things that work really take off and that hasn't happened so, so that's the case for um, positive cash flow or revenue streams or energy feedback coming from the work directly and that's why we want to collaborate on that to create a few an enterprise model that works that people can replicate and the project could grow because the the scaling theory says that you know at some point you gotta introduce the the feedback loops that provide the energy back to it because otherwise you've got a lot of people coming in and out of the project and that's what have seen we've seen over the years and even with the chapters that are operating pretty much independently right now you know they're kind of going along their own directions but nobody's coming forward to to the final product which is something that's marketable something that we can do as a real revenue model but as far as that goes we're we're pursuing the workshops today and i want to explain that so the workshops um why are we doing workshops the the reason is we are an education organization we are not a manufacturing business we happen to do extreme manufacturing but we are in the business of education and that is a, that is a critical distinction to make because a lot of people say oh yeah why don't you just you know go and produce your stuff and make money that way and do that but that's not our business we're not competing with tractor manufacturers we're not competing with Lulzbot or or Prusa 3D printers we're competing with universities and education education operations no one has uh, these extreme manufacturing workshops that they run on a regular basis we've got a unique value there and that's what we want to promote now there's a philosophical reason behind it I want to share with everybody here because it's important and that is if we we go into manufacturing, we're we're still uh, continuing that which we want to transcend, and that is the consumer culture. So what we're saying is we're going to educate people to build for themselves to become as powerful and capable as possible, so that we create the next economy. I do not believe the next economy is people are more capable and powerful than ever before. There's a case for huge consumerism like exists today. So we're paving that way by the field of education so we are educating people and yes in the in the meantime we also produce products but uh, we need to think about it as we're educating people which is what we are doing because the the mission of OSE is to create a number of production slash education these are really training facilities like a university campus that spreads worldwide that creates centers of distributed a productive activity across the globe to to counteract the the forces of centralization or or the one-size-fits-all kind of solution. So, so there's a philosophical reason for going that way. And everyone who's on a project needs to be very well aware of that. And we're clarifying, trying to make that clear to everybody who's collaborating on a project. So um, we focus our energy together to create those financial feedback loops that bootstrap the project. In other words, with zero capital, the goal is that anybody can 
has the skills and resources to start from nothing. Just like, you know, I started here from nothing, from raw land. Um, you know, I ran out of money, started crowdfunding, got some land, started doing activity, found out that we can actually sell our products, find out that the workshop model model works, that we could do extreme manufacturing, modular design, and so forth, all the techniques that we have we have done. So so with that, there's a program, there's a there's a legacy of, of theory and practice that's that's behind this and when people join they need to see what it looks like right now we're developing open source product development methods and the way people get to understand that fully is by joining as a as a developer OSC developer so once a person sees the flavor of that for a, uh, for a quarter they can qualify to be to train for process management that means they they learn how to run so the two stars after two two semesters or two quarters uh, yearly quarters um, Process management is where you start to learn how to run your own open source product development process using the techniques that we do. So, you know, how do you know when your design is ready? How do you know when you're ready to build, when you're ready to create an enterprise and so forth? That's process management. It's kind of project like project management. Project management is a part of a, a project manager would be part of a, a team. But the process manager is the really, really the guy who, who manages the development process. So once a person knows how to manage the process, they qualify to make chapters that are aligned, not just chapters that work on random stuff, but along the critical path. Because the other part about the, the Global Village Construction Set, or OSE, is that the experiment revolves around a package. It's not a bunch of individual products. It's a package that works together to create a small civilization with modern comforts. That's the idea. So, so that's our kernel. Like, if you make the, if you make the analogy to Linux, Linux got their developers. They were working on their on the ker Linux kernel. Well, in the OSC case, the Linux kernel equivalent is the Global Village construction set, a set of pre-picked things that already have a bunch of work behind it and and have various relationships, and fits common parts and all that, a common modular design language. So after you do a chapter, then the ultimate goal is people actually creating a livelihood from it. What is livelihood? Is that what you do? What you do for a living? Are you working for some company that 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 continues along the military, industrial state lines, or is it something that creates true regeneration and and health and well-being for everybody? So what do you do for a living? Are you feeding the system or are you trying to transcend it? That's so. That's after you get enough experience here. The goal is livelihood. So. The mission of OSE is to create the open source economy. How do you create the open source economy? Well, it's mass creation of right livelihoods. People uh, stepping out and becoming more powerful to do the things that they really like so that they can actually evolve to freedom. That's that's the battle cry, to evolve to freedom, to transcend um, all the different material scarcity issues that, that exist. So that's a, that's a basic framework how we operate here. And, and to sum this slide up, uh, congratulations, Emmanuel, for the uh, you've got the star. So Jose looks like he's close behind there. He's about a hundred hours or so. Now these are hours, so pay attention to this. These are hours that you have logged in the timesheet. I'm not making any of, the, any, of the, any of this up. Um, there may be some data points that people just haven't logged, but that's why it's important to log. I'm not going to put your numbers for you. This will be this is what you log to get the credit for for the development time that you have done. So, um, Jose second, then we've got set, uh, actually looks like Richard coming up on third over 50 hours, Cedric behind that, then Abe, Lashlo. Um, so these are more of the veterans have more hours, the newer people have less, but it's not impossible that a person who's, um, who's a newcomer can rapidly rise in, a, in their numbers if they put a lot of time to this. So this is a little gamification here, it's a little, little competition who's, who's at the top here, but no, it's good, good, healthy visualization of where we're at in terms of the development time. So altogether, since we started logging in February, we've got 500 hours from the team. Well, altogether, including everything, including people that quit, we actually have about 1,080 hours. So if you say maybe that's like, you know, worth 10, 20 bucks an hour, that's like $10,000, $20,000 of development time that we've contributed to the project. The people below the line here are people who have quit or who haven't uh, continued for various reasons. Um, so active, as far as the active number, we've got 10 people on an active scale here, not counting myself. Uh, but I guess Jonathan is missing. No, Jonathan, Jonathan didn't quit. He's, he's around, but he's kind of ad hoc as far as this effort goes. So 
people how are you doing on this and uh, formal feedback is what we're requesting so I actually uh, put together a feedback question we're at about the midpoint for a lot of people and for some people you're almost like at the finish of the of, of your of the 90 day cycle so it's time to renew or or quit and hopefully you renew but the, the feedback uh, in other words we welcome everybody who's doing doing well to to continue but I'd like to hear your feedback so there's a feedback questionnaire please go to that that's on a separate wiki page and it asks the critical questions of how your experience is what's working what is not how can we improve it so please spend the time to do that let us know how it's going because we want to learn and make this a better experience for everybody and of course there's much to learn and you can also see people's responses at the at the second link okay so continuing along the agenda uh, feedback form um, so we're pr going, doing pretty well so I want to also go over where we're at right now because we've built the 3d printer by now but what exactly is the definition of done so that's slide number five uh, the definition of done is the uh, as far as what I mean we talk about a distributive enterprise something that can actually generate revenue for people to support themselves with uh, or create some kind of a feedback loop that you you are actually talking about making a living or some form of livelihood from this because at the end of the day you're either gonna be getting a livelihood from this or working for somebody else or in some other job that may or may not be aligned with your interests so let's talk about what's the definition towards the point of distributive enterprise which is what we're after so we're not just talking about a product because that would be like the CAD the bill of materials the build you know we got a product you know but that's not that's not where we quit um, so those three are check marks the CAD is full the bill of materials is absolutely complete the build has been done and tested but we are short on the data collection we still need to do all that which is required and that's on the next next graph next page I won't g get into that but basically how well is the printer working how clean are the prints how fast can you print what's the m maximum size of the printer that you can use using this technique and so forth so data collection we have to do this this is what you would do on your spec sheet this is okay we've got a product and here are its va various properties its accuracy its speed its power consumption etc okay so continuing we have actually not done so much on the instructionals I know we've done them but we went straight from the instructionals to the exploded part animation videos which is very exotic and much more improved than the instructionals but for the final preparation for any workshop all the assets that someone wants to have is you want to have the written instructionals as well as exploded part animation videos as well as language agnostic instructional so that's what that's the phase we're at right now super easy to learn IKEA style build documentation which you don't need even a language for people to explain because because the symbols in there and the way it's done it's visually sufficient and of course you can go back to your instructionals and videos with voiceover which we've done once again excellent guys to everybody who did that uh, but the language agnostic instructionals are pr a pretty elite form of instructional that's good now but we have more than that workshop build manual and ebook so we want to publish an ebook that anyone building this you know you can download this say for your your uh, high school classroom and build this 3d printer so you want to have something printed which would have the the ebook or the manual which we want to produce we want to give this to every participant in the workshop for our next workshop so let's see if we can do that so it will be the language agnostic instructions we have to still add the fabrication drawings like what does a part exactly look like with labels build pictures which we only have you know from the workshop and uh, we, we do have some build pictures the build materials exploded part diagram that would go all into a, um, an attractive ebook that people can print out or use on their computer during the workshop next thing we need workshop website so as we roll out this enterprise we're creating a template for a website that we will so we're starting a new website something like 3dp.opensourceecology.org with open source code so you can replicate this website if you want to start a business uh, doing the workshops um, or something else um, we still need to do the finalization of the part library and I believe the workflow is from from the language agnostic instructionals we're gonna iron out all the last details that are still missing like very fine instructional points like do this 
this way and here's the checkpoints blah 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 because during the last build I mentioned last week people ended up taking their their axes of the 3d printer apart several times on average because it wasn't clear which direction is up or down I mean it was well it was kind of amazing but we have to do better than that because even though we had the exact model on the floor and I told people replicate this exactly and the orientation of the axis up and down matters and stuff still only one person out of the 12 builds got that right the first time so we have to do a little better than that um, so as we do the language agnostic instructions we work out the final final details that if you go through one step you know you're not gonna go return to that step because you did it wrong or you know you attach the axes to each other wrong that that has to be very explicit so once we get those final instructions explicit we finalize the part library like clean it up any inaccurate parts like little mistakes or anything we cleaned it all up and then you see this cycle here so the arrow goes back we clean up the CAD uh, the BOM I think is pretty clean so I think we're pretty good on that we clean up um, yeah mainly the CAD any instructionals that need to be updated any exploded part animations videos that need to be updated for the tiny details which matter uh, that we can do after the language agnostic instructionals so we finalize the part, part library and then once we have the final part library we can talk about and this gets more advanced but a workbench within FreeCAD where you can either drag and drop or it helps you actually scale and design the printer by making any length axes and and just a facilitation within FreeCAD using scripting creating a workbench which helps you design the D3D in the simplest implementation it's simply drag and drop of parts but we can probably do better like for example create the larger version of a, of a length or create like the larger version of the rods like instead of the 8 millimeter we go to 25 millimeter rods things like that you can scale within the final CAD so that's that um, uh, definition of done now let's go to I have this one little entertainment slide just just to tell you why 3d printing is important like I, I looked at this one part I was crazy just in this this part but it's a it's a big 90 degree elbow it costs one thousand two hundred sixty eight dollars at the local uh, hardware store and it's like 20 pounds of ABS well if we 3d print that we can save ourselves twelve hundred sixty eight dollars if we ever had to do something that's kind of entertainment here um, that's a little aside but 3d printing can be important for various parts um, and by all means for the goals for the the green the aquapana greenhouse and cd eco home we are going to print our gutters like plumbing and other things but there's definitely issues to work out like i just tried printing out the uh for example the the leaf eliminator from the rainwater catchment system and that totally messed up delamination and a failed print so you got to get things right like the enclosed build chamber is going to be one of the things to do like if you want to print larger things there are, there are like six inches or 150 millimeters or larger I mean you really need a, an enclosed build chamber if you're gonna print an ABS you can try other materials that delaminate have less problem delaminating like little layers come apart and that's that my print totally failed on this leaf eliminator you can look at the OSC workshops fa Facebook page to see how that mess went uh, but let's go back to the language agnostic instructions and the procedure for that because that is where we're at and we want to focus as much effort as possible on this and i apologize for like we were going to talk about the the oxyacetylene tort not sorry the oxyhydrogen cutting this time around but really i mean we just don't have the people to do this we need to do the instructionals uh these ones and whatever effort we have we we've got on a lyman extruder for making filament and some work on a torch table because i still want to prototype the torch table next month but it's just we don't have enough people on a team yet we really need to do more recruiting on that so but let's go through the language agnostic instructionals what that is all about so the idea is from FreeCAD is to extract isometric views so if you click on the link for isometric views it's uh, these 3d that's an isometric view for example this thing that's in 3d so it shows the thing accurately so you don't have to draw it by hand but you can extract all of that from within FreeCAD. Uh, what I did in this one here for this CB frame from 2012, that was just hand drawn. I just drew it by hand using Google Google Docs. So there's no magic there, but this but the workflow of FreeCAD can facilitate that process greatly. You've got the exact parts so you you know exactly how they look and you can manipulate them. 
Um, so taking the isometric view out of the drawing, uh, this is a drawing dimensioning workbench. Uh, it lets you get these, what we're interested, we're not interested in any of this other stuff, that's like, two, that can go in the technical drawing section of our documentation, but what we need for the language agnostic instructional specifically is this isometric. So you see a clear picture. Eliminate all the fluff, all the color, make it black and white. Uh, here I've got just minimal color, but just to point things out. But black and white, no confusion, just the part that you want from the drawing dimensional workbench. So how do you do language agnostic instructionals? Clearly you want to do things like arrows to draw, draw steps of how parts, of how the build comes together. You should label parts with um, clear labeling, like F1, like for a frame, frame number one, F2, F3, F3 up to F6 for the frame on D3D, for example. So every part should be accounted for. And you might have something like a bubble, you know, like when you show the frame, say, okay, six pieces. You might want to emphasize that or something like that. Uh, so definitely labeling. Uh, use these magnifying glass bubbles, like here, to show details. And what's a very useful thing is like this detail, you know, I show that, but it may not even be clear what I'm trying to show there. So maybe say like do one bubble there and another bubble that's, that has an X through it, meaning don't do it that way. What I tried to show there, for example, was that the F3 piece right there was in front of F9, not that F9 was like on top of F3, like F3 is on top of F9. So how the how the corner fits together there. So just little details, magnifying glass bubbles. Use arrows to point to specific details. Use the fab tool icons. So there's a page of fab tool icons here um, with a new addition in the upper left hand corner that I'm proud of. But these are all the common things that, um, um, common things we use. 3D printing, cutting, torching, drilling, wrenching, person for a symbol of how many people it takes to do something, etc. These are all icons that are useful, should be used here. I don't particularly use anything in this one, this diagram right here uh, because it's primary. Here it's actually what I should have as wrench icons because here you're putting these things together and wrenching them together. These are bolt together. So that's, uh, sorry, fab tool, tool icons. Uh, now, mark quality control points with an exclamation point, like either exclamation point or like detail bubbles that show an X through something and a check through another thing. So just kind of do it creatively. We should establish some best practices that we can all live with. And this is just like a basic instructional, but we can definitely flesh this out much more to more detail of how exactly do you do this, for example, magnifying glass bubble. What's the best practice for doing that and showing that clearly? So, and then the last step here was color over starting steps with green yeah like maybe where you start it might be green and then finish um the last step you know you got to this brick press frame stop it as red maybe you know just color it red here i, I have just the opposite maybe it should be red uh but yeah just things that make make things more clear um so that's the language agnostic instructional part and now let's go to the typical meeting goes through role division so we're at 11 30 here I want to pay attention to the time. Uh, so we should be at the progress updates here. Um, what we do is uh, scrum stand up for new people. What we do is everybody takes their, um, what they did last week. So they put their name on this. Like for example, uh, we've got, what we got here? Stand up, marching. So I didn't fill out mine, but I was, I was working on uh, just kind of trying to get my brain in order last week. I didn't do much. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I tried to get everybody going on the respective things, like like doing the LAI protocol, um, as well as the review form. Uh, those are some of the main things I did last week. And besides that, just really trying to see how the workflow uh, for, for uh, the next few weeks looks like. Because I'm thinking end of... Um, end of... June for the next workshop and one thing I did also do is uh, working on a D3D um, just I would report this D3D circuit mill so actually we've got a collaborator from the Michigan Tech University who's who's designed a full power monitoring system for our open source uh, electrical system the PV system for the CD eco home so he's doing that in June but he's also coming over and we're gonna build ourselves a, a circuit mill that's based on 
My internet's down on Google Hangouts. Oh. Okay. Got that. Got it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me know that... Um, Thank you for letting me know my internet went down on a hangout, but where I'm at, um, where did I cut off? Uh, I was going through my own stand-up. How, how much did I miss, miss out here? How much did you guys miss? I'm not sure where my internet cut out. Can someone type in the chat box? Three minutes? Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to, to my report. Uh, so what I, we report during our stand-up as far as what we've done. So my stand-up is the language agnostic instructionals protocol I've done, review forum I published, D3D circuit mill. So, so we're going to build a circuit mill based on the frame of D3D. So using belts, starting with belts and putting a spindle on. We've actually done, done a spindle, an open source spindle a few years ago. So we're going to do a circuit mill that we can do things like little circuits, like whether it's even an Arduino circuit. We can actually make our own Arduino with this kind of uh, circuit mill. Um, but it's very useful because we just, um, one of our collaborators from Michigan Tech University de designed an open source power monitoring system for the photovoltaic system that we have in the CD home. And there's a bunch of milled circuit boards there that we use. But anyway, that's when he comes to install that in June, uh, this is Shane, a collaborator. He's a, he's a grad student from Michigan Tech. Um, he's coming over and we're going to build doing late June we're going to build the circuit mill over a week period there because we're going to build on the frame and the same universal axes. The beauty of that is we're going to use the same axes but work it out for for higher precision and just a little more strength so we're going to have to strengthen up the axes a little bit uh, by using thicker rods and things like that but that's 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 coming up. Um, so that's my stand up as far as um, the work allocation um, yeah deciding on the further work allocation. So next person um, let's see Next person, can someone go after me here? Jose, tell us what you've uh, what you're doing. Yeah. Um, okay, so if you go to the link, you can go to the link to yeah. Uh, and that's basically something I saw uh, in a, in a in, in a similar. Uh, website as we want to do. Which yeah. It's called I, uh, IOBot. They have a model where you can see uh, you you upload an STL file and you can visualize it in the internet. I embed it like, just like YouTube. Mm hmm. Yeah. There's so, people in the Blender community that are using WebGL to do the same. And yeah, I, I know Sketchfab. Um, it would be good to have an open source version because that's not that's not an open source platform. It's uh, proprietary, yeah. so uh, we'll, yeah, we can use it. Uh, see okay. if we can figure it out uh, going forward. Yeah, just uh, think about it because well, I don't know if we most of what we're using now to talk is not necessarily open source either. Yeah, but you know we've got the explosion. You know, like. Um, you know, Jose, for example, on the explosion of the universal axis, I mean, that we can embed into the, the wiki already. Like, for example, on Open Building Institute, we have some 3D, 3D yeah. stuff like that. So, uh, but we have we would have to develop that own workflow for that. Uh, the guy who did that for us, yeah, it takes a little bit of skill to do that. But, yeah, we can just roll with a sketch fab for immediate purposes, but, you know, try to... Yeah, well, just to try at yeah. least to, to test the the concept of our website, and, yeah. uh, then we can change the, the technology. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I did that, and uh, you can also go to the documentation. I was basically uh, documenting the uh, requirement for the web page design, and I was also checking out some use case examples of uh, websites that I, I'm, I think they are interested yeah 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 farmbot is decent there's uh, the one i like i always keep referring to open builds like for the galleries like once we have people building our 3d printer a lot then you need a nice gallery like open builds has a nice gallery feature yeah i watched that there if you go to the documentation basically there are some services that i 
I think there are interesting like uh, location uh, information so that people know if, for instance, an event is going yeah. to be run to their location or if there are people enrolled in the community that are close and they can prepare yeah. an event. Yeah. So I think because we want people to do things, to engage in, in some kind of action. Either exactly. Uh, we, I think that the, the first priority is to find a way to turn our research, visitors into customers, people that are really taking action on uh, either by donating or uh, enrolling in a workshop or wanting to make a workshop in their location, but try to get them through uh, those steps. Yeah, and you missed the most important one. J sign up as an OSC developer, because that's yeah, how yeah, we're gonna yeah, grow yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. That, that's yeah. the idea. So, uh, yeah. I think that that should be the, our priority in the in the website. Yeah. Now the mockup that we have, that's not so. Uh, the example that we have is not yet. There. Yeah. One thing would be, you know, a very powerful thing to get future signups is, okay, say you're in a city or wherever, just put, I, I would be interested in this workshop. And then we can look at that map and we say, okay, we've got a cluster of 12 people in that area. We're going to host a workshop there, you know? Yeah, and that actually what, what I see that's interesting also for financing the, the printer, because I don't see so scalable that everyone pays for, for this printer by itself. Right. But Four people or five people, you, you can definitely uh, get joint forces and pay, you know, and then start your own workshop or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, so, yeah those are uh, what I will be working on. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the next steps, you see them here. So, I okay. need to, to move forward. I need uh, a sandbox in WordPress for, yeah place to, to work okay yeah for next time i definitely will have uh, some uh, visual prototype to discuss excellent some examples yeah thank you jose anyone else want to report on what they're what they're doing Ashlo, you on there? Chaz, Lashlo? All right, I'll go next if go ahead. Lashlo's not here. Okay, yeah, he's not. Oh. Yeah, he's not on. Okay, go ahead. So um, I, so last this past week um, I updated the universal controller log. Yeah. Um, I'm ready to purchase parts for the D3D printer. I wanted to uh, get your feedback as far as um, double checking the TB6600. Um, I found like a different uh, URL, and I just wanted to make sure that the part was the same. So yep. I took a few like screenshots of like, the parts I'm about to purchase. Yep. Uh, I got the money together, so I'm ready to purchase it. I just want to like double check with you to make sure all the parts are right ones. And that's all I need. Um, yep. As a side note, um, I was just kind of curious about um, if you've ever if OBI has ever ever collaborated with a wiki house. Yeah, of course. Like, yeah, we have. But so they're they're a totally different build method. But once we get our CNC router up and going, we can consider some of their structures. Uh, so Alistair is one of our advisors for Open Building Institute. So that's good. They re they're really doing good work. Um, yeah, yeah. But nothing specific. Like like the technologies are so different. Uh, but we can definitely try their thing for you know s other structures. The, the limiting factor there being the plywood costs, like if you're doing that, if you're just buying plywood, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of plywood that you're using for this, and it's not necessarily cost effective, it's much more expensive to do it out of plywood. I mean, the price that they have, you know, it's like five to ten times as high as the, the OBI technique, so okay. there's, a, there's a big difference in, in the cost, definitely. So, but definitely nice idea. Um, so let's look at so let's look at your stuff. Maybe we follow up like right after this. Uh, what I would yeah. suggest is everybody. Yeah, that's 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 really good. Uh, but we have the Open Source Ecology Network. Please, um, like like say like the the follow ups. Let's post that there just to make sure. Like for example, Chaz, please post that up there to um, just kind of to keep track that all the questions are answered up through the the OSC network there. That's good. 
Um, but yeah, what, what I'm seeing on, on what you're showing is good. What Chaz is doing is the scalable controller, basically taking the Arduino ramps, which is the 3D printer controller, and just adding external um, external stepper driver controllers. So for example, this stepper driver right here that we show for for $9 or $10, can drive instead of one it would drive like four of the stepper motors that we have so much much higher power we can essentially at that point control as many as many axes or as many stepper motors as, as needed like if we use the larger or using larger stepper motors which the small ramps could not handle so that's good since Lashlow's not here let me see if I can um, go through his um, video so he's um, let's see, so he's got some more work on the assembly videos, that, which is pretty cool. Um, for the people that haven't seen these, this is the kind of stuff that we've been working on. Yeah, we've seen, we've seen a lot of that, but basically the, the voiceover exploded part animations in progress. The only thing I'm going to say about those, there's page number seven, um, we want to return to this so this is not a done case but once we do return to this after the language agnostic instructions we want to make sure that we have all the source files so that we can make updates to it the source files meaning the caden live edit file as well as the freecad file so that someone can actually take that instructional and edit it by downloading the source so that's that's good it's something that more of the documenter role can can pursue like a People who haven't done the CAD but they know how to do free CAD, they can do these exploded part animations, learn how to do that. That's a really good skill set to have. Um, yeah, okay. So that's Lashlow. I'm not seeing so much. Let's see who else has got a report here. We got Jose, we got Lashlow, Chaz. Really don't have a, Roberto, heated bed. Is that old or is that new? And Abe. Roberto and Abe, do you guys want to? Pipe in. Let's see, Roberto. Or not really. Uh, Abe, Abe, go ahead. Oh, the screen screen share. Okay, here. Ah, oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm nuts. Yeah, Abe, please go ahead. You've been working on a on a filament extruder. What we've been doing is going through the parts of it and seeing if we can build it as is. So so basically, it's kind of like an open source assessment. We look at what's already there. Abe, continue. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll go down my log. I started the week doing the extruder winder in FreeCAD and exploring the uh, existing STLs from the Lyman files. Um, Lemon uh, filament extruder, yep. Mm -hmm. Obvious conclusion that I guess the best way to handle those STLs is to just trace over them with FreeCAD. Uh, I didn't see a very good way yeah. to convert them. Obviously, that's just the way STLs are. Uh, so there'll be a lot of, there'll be some work to do on all those parts uh, for the whole extruder, I guess. But, right, um, so yeah. I, I noticed... Um, I noticed there was a difference in um, Lyman's uh, copyright or uh, the Creative Commons license, but it didn't look like that would be a significant issue. It's just non-commercial. What? No, it's not. It can be non-commercial. If it's non-commercial, we can't use well, it. It's um, Creative Commons, let's see, NCSA 3.0 on some of those, but then I saw a different link later where it looked like maybe he updated some versions to 4.0 so it may have changed at different times for different wait a minute can you this is a serious like issue them are in C. on the actual drawings no way well if that's well, the case that's what's listed in the uh i thought i had posted that to my log page. that's in a couple of places i thought that i guess i should have emailed you about that but i didn't think it was i figured because OSE is uh not profit that maybe that wasn't such an issue but i thought maybe okay. the non-commercial would make it difficult for the business side of things because 
obviously that's... Okay, now that's... Uh, okay, we need to look at this issue. Please, please email me exactly those links where you see the NC, and, and we need to email him and see what's up with that, because... No, if it's NC, we cannot use it for our workshops. We cannot it's, sell it. It's that's in the what zip it means. file. Well, the okay, so that's... A, in the zip files. Okay, so are, that, that's an issue. So we need to email him. I, I'm in contact with him right now, so I can email him. I say, hey, uh, the, I mean, I looked at that before, and I, I did not see any NCs there, like because uh, I typically look at the license as the first thing I look at. Um, but we need to resolve that issue before we go further, because that means, yeah, we can build it, but if we can't produce it at a workshop, uh, how am I going to motivate everybody to work on it if they can't you know, make a... I mean, the, the, the basic idea there is you have to be able to make a living from it, Otherwise, um, you're not motivated to work on it because you're basically doing development for somebody who's... It, essentially, it's actually... The NC clause means that you're working for somebody else. In other words, that guy owns it. He has the rights to that. He can sell it. You do development, but you can't sell it, but he can. So you're effectively his employee working for free. So that's not right. Um, that's one way to translate what NC means. It means that you, <laughs> from one perspective, you're working for somebody else and not getting paid for it, or you or it cannot generate any financial value from it for working for somebody else. So no, that's uh, I, I need to email this guy and, and we need to clarify that because that means we either uh, have to go with another design or uh, the license is changed. Because because that license means that you know we can't just do that and sell it because. Uh, First of all, that's not not it's not ethical, and you could actually get sued for that, for doing that if you um, if you do that against his license because the license prohibits that. Okay, so that's uh, Abe. We're gonna have to resolve that. I'm, I'm I guess I'm gonna if you can send that to me immediately. I need to look into that and email the guy because what I know is that the the funders of this project when when he was funded to design the the Lyman extruder that was a contest that he won. And I thought that contest was that the all the product of that contest would be open source, but apparently that's not. We need to clarify that. So, okay. Yeah, it's different. I think in different files because I copied yeah. one that was in Z from one file, and then I see in another file it's it's just BYSA uh -huh. 3.0. So okay, it, there may have been some confusion. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but that's just a thing we need to clarify. And I, I think it's going to be okay, but, but we need to make sure that we're in a right course here. Okay. Yeah, actually, it's specifically on the winder, mm -hmm. it says NC, okay. and on the, the, the main extruder, it's not. Okay. That's, so we know that we can definitely do at least the, the extruder, which is a, a good start, so we can, you know, we can go with that. But the winder, yeah, we're, we're going to have to resolve that. Um, so, okay, Abe. No, that's that's good. That's good. Good for knowing. And for some reason, I that that skipped me. I I I missed that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it looks like it's just that way on the winder. So maybe mm -hmm. he'll want to resolve that or change it. I don't know how that works legally. Yeah. But, um, and let's see. Then I I continued um, freaking SDL stuff, and then I moved on to that visual bomb of the uh -huh. uh, extruder. And I think I've gotten about halfway through that with the uh, main, uh, so the electronics and various hardware parts. Uh, okay, uh, I'm not seeing the so, link on your log. Is that on your log there? Oh, um, see, you know, I don't have a link to the doc yet. Let me do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, please put that in, and we can take a look at that. So that's good. Good work. Um, moving forward on the extruder, but the idea there is that if we want to recycle our plastic, uh, get rid of plastic trash waste that's this is what we're doing here it's a very attractive thing and we're, we're aiming to you know the timeline here is if we go towards the end of I mean really towards the end of June for the next workshop we've got a couple of weeks maybe three weeks three to four you know, right now we're at the uh, the eighth we've got three weeks to pretty much uh, do this design if we're gonna ever consider building it because if we wanted to during the next like actually offering it as an experimental workshop because what we could do is we could run a build of the 3d printers and at the same time we could have like a second day where we have an experimental build of the extruder which would be a i think a very nice thing to do so that's that's kind of how we're looking at it in the next three weeks we would have to 
uh, get enough documentation and and possibly some parts already to test test things out and offer that as an experimental work workshop addition to the existing workshop and possibly even that if we announce the workshop for the 3d printer we can even roll out okay now we're actually adding the extruder experimental workshop at the end of that so we might have another week of time to uh, get that going before we actually make the announcement but the announcement for the workshop needs to be 30 days before the actual event to get people to sign up and the goal is actually i mean i'd like to see a double uh, as far as the number of people attending we had no problem with the 12 people that were there in terms of space or organization uh, but if we want to double the number of people building it that means we got to get more people better marketing better uh, better product so we we want to really spend some time i i need to what i need to do here the main thing is to get the print cluster going i need to have like four printers running to produce the parts or a single printer with four heads <laughs> so um last time i had two Lulzbot minis going for about two weeks to produce all the parts it's a lot of printing now we're we're gonna need like if we're gonna double the population of the workshop we're gonna need to have like four printers printing for like two weeks full time so that's that's a lot of work we need to get that uh, cluster up and going okay so that's i think that's good uh, roberto can you um report on where you are Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. That sounds good. So what I'm thinking here, let me mute you there. Yeah. What I'm thinking here is, is uh, one direction of the recruiting that we need to do is um, we can focus on documenters at this point. The thing is we're definitely missing skills. Like I think we're, I think that I would evaluate the weak point is that we don't have enough instructional materials. Like for example, I didn't have enough time to prepare. Okay. Here's a full instruction on how to use the assembly, um, or the how do you extract the isometric views from the FreeCAD drawings? Um, that's an instructional right there. But for a lot of things we're doing, we can have have people following up with us doing documentation. How do you do this step and so forth? Um, so I think we can shift more towards documenters. I mean, we need yeah, we need all kinds of people. But I think the documentation direction is something that someone can wrap their head around pretty clearly. And you won't necessarily have to be generating the CAD files, but you would have to be manipulating them, like documenting how something is built or how to use this new module in FreeCAD and so forth. But that can happen by all of us learning together. Like if we actually interview different people on a team, like for example, Emmanuel, uh, you know, he knows a lot more about uh, FreeCAD right now than most of us here. So we could interview him, okay, how do you do this particular step? Or all you guys who have picked up specific skills, okay, how do you do this little thing like, you know, like the belt thing or the wires, for example, Roberto and stuff like that. Like all those little things in FreeCAD that can be documented into tight instructionals, we should be doing that as much as possible. So that's something like, Richard, if you're uh, listening on here, we could definitely uh, try to have a push for the documenter kind of person. Now, I think the most effective thing to do that would be uh, actually me getting on a box saying, okay, here's where we are on D3D, like what I showed in slide number four. And we say, okay, now we need documenters. So, for example, language agnostic instructionals, the ebook, like that's all documentation related stuff. It's more documentation than design because we've got so much of the design already. So, definitely, I could, uh, I'm thinking about. Um, if I get any time today, I'm going to do just a quick one, like five minutes. This is where we are on the project. This is our numbers for the team. Join us. But we need documentation work to make this happen faster rather than, than later. Uh, so last thing is let's go. We're running out of time here, but let's go to the role allocation slide number eight then. 
and see where we are and that is that accurate so this is what we've been doing um, Manuel did the leaf eater for the rainwater system. It's a slightly unrelated, but that's what we're working on physically right now. We're installing the rainwater collection system on the eco home. Um, universal controller, Chaz is moving right forward with it, and I'm going to review those, um, review the parts because Chaz can, for like 50 or 100 bucks, he can actually prototype remotely the larger controller system which is just new wiring and but allowing us to do many more stepper motors at a time to run larger machines like if we still want to do the larger printer uh, we can do it with that now IO um, I think he was actually busy for this meeting but he's I got him going on oh yeah so the thing I met I forgot to mention is this one post I put on on the network which is about all of you guys need to get yourself a 3D printer and we can collaborate on doing that. I can print the parts for you, but I need to get the cluster up and running. I put a post on that on the network. Um, if you go to... So Lashlo started his first language agnostic instructionals. The note there being to remove the color, strip it down. Uh, but here... Um, no, that's language agnostic instructionals. Uh, here's this, yeah, here's this post from May 5th, so that's a few days ago. It's important to get all our hands on a 3D printer uh, because we can make a super low cost version. The frame is the most limiting part, but we can do this. That's a 3D printed PZ, PVC plus PVC thing. We can do that and still it will work. We can still attach the axes to it and make everything work just as normal. So I've got seven responses here for what people's resources are and how they'd like to go about that. Um, so we are, Io, our new 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 guy, uh, he's working on that to make that happen. And I can print that out as soon as we can and test it out. But also, um, the other part that's missing is a low cost extruder head, like th this, one of these. What I'm thinking is for this, you can simply take a hollow threaded rod and a bunch of washers. And that you could do for like a dollar. And then you have this heater block and a nozzle. Then the nozzle itself is like a dollar, you know, and the block would be like a dollar. So for a few bucks, you can get one of these instead of forty dollars. This is forty. That's a high performance. Uh, that's the E3D nozzle. That's the better ones that allow you to print in any material. So turn forty dollars into five dollars or something like that, or three dollars. Um, we want to start that. Uh, I was going to ask actually uh, Ahmed if you would want to take that on, like actually take a look at the extruder design because I actually don't have you on anything here. Uh, that's a thing that we can definitely do for a low-cost printer, because nobody's really taken on the super low-cost re replicable extruder head, from what I've seen. Everyone just gets these these expensive ones, like this one, uh, which is also on a, on a network post. It's $40, it's like 32 Great Britain pounds. But this would allow us to modify, like for example, we can put like, if we want to supersize this, we put two heater blocks on it because we you know we got threaded rod going through this there's a threaded rod bunch of washers and you can screw like one or two heater blocks so we can talk about you know the larger nozzles largest nozzles available are 1.2 millimeters what if we went even larger than that so that's the idea but to get it under our control part of a very low cost 3d printer that would be a thing to do there so uh, maybe Ahmed and I we can uh, communicate on that otherwise um, We'll probably want to join the language agnostic instructionals team just start learning about that but as we go forward here okay l let's just stick to what we're doing here so jose's got the website Chaz is working that cedric uh cedric's got the um, extruder and i think we're pretty done cedric are you here no cedric's not here but if he's done on, he's probably probably done on the extruder part the new updated extruder um Maybe, you know, maybe Cedric and Ahmed, you could work on the, the open source version of the extruder. That other one is open source too, but it's pricey. And I think we can do a decent one that's made with simple materials, accessible. Like, I mean, especially for your guys' case. You're in, you told me that in Iraq there, it's hard for you to get parts or it takes a long time. Or for Nigeria, it might be more, more um, leeway if we make our own. So March in here, I'm going to be working on a print cluster and uh, all this other stuff. Uh, Abe's got the filament extruder. Yeah, we're going to resolve that. So everyone's pretty much on the language agnostic instructionals. Lashlo, Roberto, Ma Michael, 
Jean Baptiste. I think Jean Baptiste is traveling right now in Frank. So Michael, welcome to the team. By the way, um, forgot to introduce you, but Michael is joining. He's been eager to join and finally did it. Loosen up some of his schedule. Um, but that's something we can do now. So Ahmed, we can communicate after this with Cedric, myself. But the thing I want to mention here, the, the missing link is how do you get, for example, those isometric drawings and the refining a procedure for language agnostic instructional. So what I would suggest there as an experiment is um, whoever figures out how to uh, extract like, you know, a five, you know, couple of minute video, download the, the workbench for the part, uh, the fabrication drawings or the the what's it called the that workbench is called um, drawing dimensioning whoever figures out that out first put up a video and then put up your source like your Caden live file and edit like just get the thing up there or and then we can actually collaboratively edit it to a tight thing because what we want to do there like okay so language agnostic instructionals what we do is we start with a script right but that script goes so let's just kind of like start on that because I want to really see how we collaboratively teach each other and we kind of can go into upgrading the instructional file. So the script goes like this. It says to download um, drawing dimensioning workbench, do this. Then blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And <laughs> And then at the end, now then cut and paste your your isometric into this Google Doc, you know, cut and paste whatever the steps are. But but we want to do that a nice instructional so that you know each one of us is going to spend hours going through videos probably you know hours or you know 20 minutes or half an hour or something um, hour from between you know 15 minutes to hours going through that. So let's help each other by creating a video that has all that info, the critical stuff for OSE. So we can focus our time so that none of us on a team waste time looking all over the place. Uh, so let's try that. And, and I'm going to try that too. I'm going to see if today, after this, I'm going to look at the, the drawing dimensioning. And if, if I can figure it out in, in a few minutes, then definitely want to capture it in a shorter time, like you know a five minute video. So nobody has to spend more than five minutes to figure out exactly how to download that that workbench and make it work. So that's that's a that's a piece of learning. But once again, this is the kind of stuff that our documenters, our curriculum developers, should be working on. They should be following us, what we do, giving us learning materials. I just can't do it all. I'm trying to manage the meeting, do some physical work here. Uh, I've been working some on uh, CD Eco Home and stuff like that. So I got you know I got my hands busy certainly. So we could definitely outsource that to documenters who can join a team. So I'm gonna try to, I think a high priority for me would be to, to focus on a little video specifically to recruit documenters and we can pass that around. So I think I, I gotta kinda wanna wrap it up here. Um, let's just go through the suggestions and questions page. Where are suggestions and questions? So questions. Lashla, what's the challenges, difficulties of molding the parts of the D3D instead of printing them? Molding? Like injection molding? Well, I would say the only challenge there is a $10,000 machine for injection molding. Otherwise, you can use a $300 3D printer. Uh, second question. Lashla, could the 3D, 3D be used to print out liquidized clay and then apply some heat to harden that, creating a molding base? Absolutely. Uh, one of the uses for D3D, uh, they do have syringes that print clay through a syringe and then you bake it to make a final product or even you can use a setting clay. So yes, printing in ceramics is well known for 3D printing. That's a very nice application. You can be making your pottery with that and then firing it. So that's awesome. Now the other part about casting, you can use, 3D print a mold that you put into a regular metal casting process that way you can get metal metal casting as well. So that's that's the answer to the second question for Lashlow. Um, so there's more questions. I'm going to go to the feedback. Uh, I think we can. We've got a feedback page here, and I'm going to go back to the. So here's the suggestions. 
Um, let's just go through that quickly before I go back to the answer the other questions. Latch the reference absolutely Obsolete Google Drive docs or YouTube videos can break other pages. A workaround for this could be use transclusion. Create a wiki page for something which needs to be referenced. For example, Waxes assembly video. This wiki contains embedded code of the video and can be versioned. Then in the workshop page and everywhere else, reference the wiki page with blah, blah, blah. So it's a content that would be included. Example. What do you think? Transclusion is a good idea. We should be using it. Uh, so what you should do, Lashlo, is create a one minute video that summarizes to the rest of the team what that means because it takes a few minutes to get one's head around what transclusion is so instructional video yes Jose education includes the team as well as developers right yes team capacity development learning on basic agile standards and philosophy is good as well as enterprise processes this related somehow to the roadmap of developer developer reputation well absolutely in a developer reputation what you would do is once you get to the process manager training, you would get some badges for for various skills like agile, lean, uh, open source product development methodologies or, or just product development in general. So various badges that have to be created and, and training courses. So once again, curriculum development and all of that, of which we're all short and hence the need for curriculum developers. Okay. Next question, next comment, color code plastic parts and instructions. Explore explore coloring recycled plastic absolutely um, so last time we were scrambling kind of to get everything printed had different colors of filament but yes uh, if you color code things that will be another way to do things much more easy you can also do do things like the the CAD file itself shows like actually it has a little print on it that says up or down or this way you know you can annotate with 3d printing so once we get more advanced at this that's called production engineering how do you produce this so it's foolproof? Definitely. And definitely we can color recycle plastic to whatever colors we want. Personally, I'd like to have it all black. <laughs> okay, any color as long as it's black. Dedicated sysadmins and IT support learn to help with tech issues and explore resolutions to current collaboration software and, and issues and software. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we need to recruit those people. Um, that This is, once again, that falls into the category of and... Uh, expanding the team by recruiting the people to, that can help us with that. We don't have a, an IT team yet. We actually do that. I believe we have an announcement for an IT team. I'm not sure, Richard, if we do that. I think that we have an announcement flowing out there, but no one's really applied for that yet. So, yeah, we definitely want to get a good sysadmin in IT. I mean, uh, that's a gap. That's a big gap in the program right now. Okay. Uh, more questions. So the last question I see here, Richard, what are the specific skills to target for documenters? Well, if we can, we can basically go off the the slide number four for that, and we could say to do, you know, doing explode part animation videos, do, doing instructionals, um, e publishing an ebook, doing fab drawings from FreeCAD, um, doing editing like like in Scribus for the ebook, drawing up bills of materials, doing explode part diagrams, which are all functions that come out of FreeCAD. Um, and that could be like graphics, infographics that go into the ebook, uh, making icons for for our language agnostic instructionals. There's a bunch of graphics people, like graphics visualization and art people that we can involve in um, in the publishing part. And then for things like, yeah, yeah. And then the other people who simply document FreeCAD functionality, either either by talking to members of our team or by studying other instructionals that are out there. And, and Lashlo, for example, asked, well, why do you why do you want to do another video? There's so many of them. Well, but that's the point. Like, all those videos that are out there, um, if you read my response, I uh, actually went through a, a lengthy response on that, on the, on the, the development network. There was a question, like, he was asking about language agnostic instructionals, and then the last question he asked was, why are you doing videos? Look at this excellent, you know, 20 or 30 minute video right there. And I pointed out, look, this thing has no voice. It's not edited. It's on a malware operating system, namely Windows. It's long and re repetitive. Sorry for that joke. It's, uh, it's also done in Japanese. So it's like, yeah, we can improve that. Tighter, better, more clear. Um, five minutes, not 30 minutes. That's the goal. So, But read through this email. It's quite instructive on 
Uh, it's a discussion on language agnostic instructionals and, and uh, if we do make instructionals on FreeCAD, what the kind of standards we should have. I mean, absolutely starting with voice, because I mean, some people think you can't follow the ones that are uh, that have no voice in it, but it's just so much harder. And for me, that's, I don't even want to you know, strain my eyes. Like if I can't hear it, I, I really dislike straining my eyes and trying to figure out like, you know, spending another hour just being able to absorb the content because there's no language, you know, there's, uh, we got to do better. So anyway, that kind of wraps up uh, what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. And um, maybe we could, we could follow up like Ahmed, maybe we can uh, follow up on what you'd like to do and, and follow up on some other things here with Chaz. But other than that, um, next step, the big thing is the language agnostic instructionals. And, and let's try that video, like the instructional video. Like as soon as anybody has anything decent on, okay, here's a first good page. Like Lashlow started already. He's got his post with, with his uh, language agnostic instructional first stab. That's good, good start, but let's keep going. I mean, this is really art. This is where um, your information graphics people your real artists kind of come into play um, but we can definitely do a first cut at it and we can still do a lot of the elements of that and, and then as we do that because we put it into cloud editable docs we can have the artist just say okay come on in now clean it up you know make it look great so that's that's where we would need artists but let's do that so I think we're gonna quit it quit here um, any other last minute questions or are we good yeah, let's let's email and continue the discussion on uh, on email, and uh, we'll take it from here. So thanks a lot, guys, for paying attention here, and let's keep going at this. And um, the the next main step being the larger workshop coming up in June, and of course the vision is of course that as soon as we work all these details out, have a website, you can all replicate this, and hopefully you can be start start thinking on how that will be possible to make that happen in many different places because all this stuff is open source that we're doing so thank you and we'll talk we'll talk soon guys and email me with any questions follow-ups do the follow-ups on on the network osc network network.opensourceecology.org thanks a lot